This week on Applied Science, I'd like to give a follow-up on my Ruby laser project, and also I'd like to welcome the new subscribers that Nighthawk and Light sent my way. Uh, Nighthawk and Light has a really great YouTube channel, and I'll put a link in the description. And if you're curious more about my background, check out the Embedded.fm podcast on which I was recently interviewed. Okay, let's check out the Ruby laser. Before we get into the details, let's take a look at some footage of this bad boy in action. So here the beam is focused onto a standard single-edged steel razor blade. And as you can see, uh, the laser makes it through in one pulse. So a ruby laser is pulsed, unlike a typical CO2 laser in a laser cutter, which is more or less a continuous beam. Here the laser is focused onto a stainless steel kitchen knife. This is substantially thicker than the razor blade, and as you can see, the laser doesn't make it through the knife, although it does leave a weld site. So it could potentially be used to weld something of this thickness. Here's the laser focused onto a freestanding piece of hardwood. This is walnut. And if you look carefully, you can see that the walnut actually rocks backward from the force of the laser blast. And what's happening here is the uh, wood is being vaporized and all the gas emitted from that crater basically that the laser is creating forces the wood backwards. A ruby laser works by discharging a flash tube near a ruby rod. In this case, the flash tube is coiled up into a helix and the ruby rod is running down the middle of the helix. And when this happens, with enough light, the rod actually emits red light out the ends. And if we put two mirrors on either end that are very carefully aligned, the light will bounce back and forth between the mirrors, uh, going back through the rod many times and being amplified as it does so. And uh, the front mirror is only partially reflective, so we actually get a beam of light coming out the front, whereas the back mirror is fully reflective. And in this case, I just have a plain old glass uh, magnifying lens here, positive focal length lens. And so the beam comes out straight here and then hits the lens and focuses down to a point. And the point is where uh, I'm putting the object that I want to drill a hole in, so the, the razor blade or whatever. And so basically this entire system is just a very elaborate photo flash. It's basically one of these. It's just beefed way up. So the... Um, amount of you know power and voltage in one of these might be you know a few hundred volts and maybe 50 or 100 joules and the voltage for this is nearly 6,000 volts and we're carrying close to 8,000 joules. Uh, discharge times are approximately the same so if this thing is going to discharge about 8,000 joules it does it in two milliseconds so the average power into the flash tube is four megawatts. Um, there's actually an inductor back here to smooth this out so you may know that if you take a capacitor bank and just discharge it through a very low resistance thing, you'll get a huge amount of current first, and then it kind of tapers way down. But we don't want that because this thing could take tens of megawatts at the, in the first instant it's discharging, and then it kind of tapers way down. We'd like this just to be on constant brightness, one, so we don't blow the tube up, but also just so that we get sort of even pumping for this entire two millisecond duration. The other major component is a cooling water system, which is here. This is a recirculating uh, tub of water with a pump and a chiller. And that's so that we can keep the uh, ruby rod and flash tube submerged in cool water. With, uh, you know, 8,000 joules going through this thing at every pulse, uh, we need to carry that heat away or else all the internal components here will melt. And that actually leads us to the problem of why this laser is not working right now. So let's zoom in and I'll show you what the status is. In normal operation, this entire vessel is sealed up and the end caps are set up like this with an o-ring on the inside there that seals against the ruby rod. And that way I can submerge this entire cavity with water and so you can see the hose fittings coming off the top here, an inlet and an outlet. And then the hose is here going down to the water circulator. Um, I tried to run this dry when I was first starting out the project and it, it's impossible. So I had silicone high temperature o-rings in the end plates like this, holding, holding the ruby rod and sealing like that. And after one shot, the half of the o-ring was completely vaporized. So I realized that I, I would have to have water in contact with this. Uh, there's just no other way around it. And so I used silicone to seal this cavity shut. And as you can see, it's nice and shiny inside there so that when the flash tube goes off, we try to save as many photons as possible and get them to go into the ruby rod. So this thing was working great and I took this to Maker Faire in 2014 and ran it for maybe about an hour at the fair and then had a problem. Uh, I didn't realize it, but there was some dirt on the inside of this uh, cavity here. It might have been sealant that squeezed out or, or grease or something, but it started to vaporize and it made a dark spot on the front of the ruby rod, which I didn't notice. 
And so then on subsequent firings, that dark spot absorbed so much energy, it actually damaged the face of the, of the rod here. And so I, I think it would probably still work. I haven't tried to run it since having the, the rod damaged. Um, but I, I, maybe I'll put it together and try it, or maybe I'll try to find a surface to, or service to resurface the uh, ruby rod. This plastic bit here is an insulator so that when the uh, metal container with the rod and everything is on here, I can zap this with the high voltage pulse to initiate the discharge, and I don't have to connect the rest of this metal to the high voltage source. Also, keep in mind that the alignment of the two mirrors is very critical, but the alignment of the rod is actually not so bad because the two faces are parallel to each other. So even if the whole rod is turned like this, a light beam going in will just move over a little bit and shoot out in the same direction. So it, uh, it should be aligned with the rod in place, but again, if something in here moves, it's not that critical. So the whole plastic mounting system doesn't really affect the accuracy. It's, it's really the metal bits here. And speaking of alignment, the way that this is aligned is to put a helium neon laser in the front and shoot it into the ruby laser and then adjust the knobs here. And what will happen is when the uh, alignment system shoots the helium ne neon laser back into itself, there'll be an interference pattern created. Let's take a look at some other projects. This is my cookie machine. The idea is that it holds ingredients in all of those hoppers that you can see there and then dispenses them in quantities small enough so that you can make a single cookie. And this way you can have a cookie sheet full of cookies, each one with a different recipe because you can dispense the ingredients for each one individually. I made this for Maker Faire 2013 and uh, it still more or less works. I think the butter holder actually broke, or the butter dispenser. But other than that, it's fine. And uh, if I were going to come back to this project, the next thing to do is to build a mixer. So dispensing all the ingredients is uh, difficult, but not terrible. Um, but mixing them together and then squirting them out onto the baking sheet without losing any of it is quite difficult. Because, you know, a cookie is only maybe a tablespoon or two of volume. And then some people have suggested, well, you should couple it up to one of those uh, conveyor belt ovens. And so the thing could just plop the cookie down you know, mixed in everything and then send it through the oven. So it's literally like a push, one, one click uh, on demand hot cookie dispenser. So uh, if I ever come back to that, that will be the next development. This is my home built scanning electron microscope that I built in 2011. Uh, most of the images that you've seen from scanning electron microscopes on my channel have come from an early 1980s commercial scope but I actually built this one prior to getting a commercial scanning electron microscope. So let's take a look at some of the images from this one. This is a mechanical wristwatch. This one is a pocket watch. This is a MEMS accelerometer. And this is a gold necklace chain. As you can see, the resolution isn't very high. The whole project was done just for proof of concept. It was a lot of fun to build a scanning electron microscope, and the learning that I got out of it was really worth more than any image I could create with it. So as you can see, I've taken it apart, and the column is down in the bucket of parts there on the floor, and I was actually using the chamber for something else, and so now I have a much better vacuum pump, a turbomolecular pump on there, and uh, occasionally I'll use this vacuum chamber for other experiments. Coming up soon on my channel will be experiments using extremely high pressure chambers. I've always wanted to create like a 100,000 PSI environment, and there's quite a lot of weird things that happen when pressures get that high. So stay tuned for more stuff uh, involving pressure. Okay, see you next time. Bye.